Hello, it's all strong nation. Joe Simon's like diamonds back again. Got my partner here and broski Luke yep. Simons like diamonds. What's up, dude? Not uh, much. Let's do this. This is going to be a helpful one. This is something that I think we've all stumbled on over the years and uh, time to highlight some mistakes. Uh, bad habits is really what we're calling. Them. So five bad habits that destroy your chances of consistently catching fish. This was a question asked to us. And meaning, hey, there's bad habits that fishermen have. And we're like, yeah, because <laughs> we all have had them or have them still. And there's five really big ones that stood out that I, I think, to your point, Luke, everyone goes through them at some point or another. If you can fix all five of these, you will become a really consistent angler. You will catch more fish per trip. Your confidence will go up you will just be an overall like much better angler and probably, you know, to the point you could coach other people and help other people out. So let's start with number one. Let's just get right into it. Once again, these are five bad habits that most fishermen have or have gone through at one point or another. So number one, what do we got, Luke? Yeah, let's talk about depth control. Yes. This is the depth of either lures or live bait. Both of them are very important. And this is an issue that a lot of us have. Uh, it's holding a lot of people back, and it's just about always considering the the running depth of your lure, or if you're using a live bait, the natural depth that it's going to go, and then so that way you can add more weight or or uh, or more flotation based on the specific area you're fishing and the species that you're targeting. A lot of people don't get this right, and that is a huge issue because you can be in the really good spot with hungry fish, and if you don't have your lure or bait at the right depth, you might as well not be in a good spot. Right. And I think the bass fishing like arena has done a good job with this. I, I maybe you can envision this. I've seen it out there before where it's an image, it's an animated image and it's, it's basically a bank, right? And you got a, basically a shelf that goes down and at the bottom, right. Is like two large mouth bass, right. And you got the fisherman up there and it's basically showing the different levels of this water column. And unless he's in that bottom area, that bass is not going to come up and hit it by his feet. Uh, or, or even if it's 10 feet deep, if you're fishing at seven with a bobber, it, yeah, there's times where there's so hungry, they'll come up. But in most cases, you want to get that worm or whatever you're using your crawl dad, you want to get it right in front of that bass's face. And it's the same with saltwater fishing. We, one of the very first podcast we did the very first live on the water one remember that you guys got to witness me if you watch that one learning this the hard way. And Luke had a heavier jig head. He was getting down closer to the bottom where these feeding fish were. I was way up here and I literally got zero strikes. I mean, this is all on film live. Luke kept catching all the fish. And until I finally used a larger jig head to get the lower depth control, all of a sudden I started catching fish. There are so many times I promise you that you've been in an area with tons of fish and you caught nothing because your lure or your live bait was not anywhere close to the actual feeding fish. Yeah. And so I'll say one lure in particular, because we, I see it all the time and it's popping corks, right? We're using a popping cork and have a lure underneath. Those, those aren't really popular at all for freshwater fishing. And, and I think it's a, a big reason why is because a lot of bass anglers are fishing steeper banks. Whereas in saltwater, we have a lot of flats and the bottom is, is pretty level. So if you can actually get it set up properly where the, the popping cork and your lure underneath it is at a good depth, it'll apply to the whole retrieve, whereas bass fish is not so much. But what a lot of people get wrong is that if you're fishing, say, a, a flat with a channel that goes down or that has a pothole that's a little bit deeper, now that popping cork, yes, it's an advantage of attracting attention to the lure, but if those fish aren't really active, right, if, if the fish are active, they'll kind of hit anything. It's really about about matching your, your presentation to those days when the fish aren't gonna be active and, and you really have to get near them. As Joe said, sometimes if you don't get right in their face, they're not gonna eat it. And so using a popping cork, it, it prohibits you from, from getting your lure down to those fish that are holding to the bottom of the potholes, which is often the case, particularly in the winter time. So, so that's a, just, just one example of many that, that I've seen, I guess probably the example I see most frequently, but the same thing applies with light bait. Similar thing, right? Floating some shrimp, uh, again, over a grass flat and a, like a live shrimp and same thing. If it's on the shallow flats, it's great. But then as soon as it gets deeper, now that shrimp is going to be a couple feet off the bottom. And if those fish aren't active, they're not going to swim those extra couple feet. Whereas if you had 
if you had it free lined or if you had a little split shown on it to let it get down there at the bottom, right in the fish's face, that'll make all the difference in the world. Yep. And same with docks. You know, we've seen people fish docks. We love dock fishing. In most cases, not 100%, but in most of them, and especially in the middle of the day, those fish are at the bottom. And unless like if you're using like a power prawn, that's like our favorite lure for fishing docks, your jig head better be heavy enough to you want to feel it popping off the bottom. You want to feel it hitting the bottom. That is when you catch the fish. If you had someone just skipping something underneath like a paddle tail and whipping it back, they're going to catch nothing. The fish will just be down there. They might gaze up and laugh at it. But in most cases, they probably don't even see it up there. I mean, you have to have your bait on the bottom. That's why depth control is so cruel. That, that's why on that power prawn, why we're not a big fan of some of these super fancy, realistic looking, you know, shrimp, shrimp lures, because they're, they're pre-rigged that you can only use them in one depth. So the depth control is, goes out the door. You're now basically in the bad habit. Number one is not thinking about where these fish are going to be holding what depth. So nothing worse than actually finding a good spot, right? That, that's one of the hardest things to do. And it's the most important and then getting there, not having your lure, your live bait in the right presentation. I mean, Peter Deeks in that live bait course, I mean, he spent a whole module talking about using the right weight to make sure your bait is in that right, you know, that right depth. It is depth control is absolutely critical. Yeah, critical for live bait and lures. And, and you mentioned that no, I think the, nothing worse than than like fishing some docks and not catching anything. And then someone comes behind you and starts crushing them. And that's happened before. And, yeah. and, and a big thing too, again, I, I, I've learned this the hard way. I never used to use jig heads more than a quarter ounce. Like I, I would just never use them. And, and uh, not coincidentally, but I never thought about it. I never really did good at docks that were more than like eight feet deep. And uh, now I'm starting to use a lot of half ounce jig heads. And now I'm catching way bigger fish much more consistently because now I'm getting down to the bottom of those deeper docks and guess where a lot of the bigger fish are holding next to the deeper stuff that the deeper structure. So uh, again, we all go through it and just thought this would be the first, the first uh, kind of bad habit to highlight because I'm sure a lot of other people are, are in the, in that rut as well. Yeah. And, and just not even conscious of it in many cases. So the good news is if you need help on that, we, uh, we have a whole cheat, you know, cheat sheet, a whole PDF, on that and in our insider club we have all kinds of you know videos on that as well on exactly what lure or live bait to use based on where you're at what depth etc uh pretty cool so it's all there at the salt strong insider club so number two let's move on to number two i talked about spots being so important number two is around that and it's around the 90 10 and if you don't know what that means it's that 90 percent of all feeding fish can be found in about 10% of any area at any given time. We just took the drone up this week. Wait till you see, we got some sick, sick, sick footage of sc big schools of redfish, big schools of snook, and even that one snook and that big school reds. Uh, wait till you see this stuff. It is epic. Got a brand new drone. The It, it is so clear. And in every case, it, it, the 9010 is, applies. In every single case, you can literally look down and if Everything you see is 100%. All the fish are in about 10% of, of any area. They're all holding in one place for a specific reason. And, and yet, the majority of people find themselves in that 90% zone where there's no fish, right? Or maybe 10% of the fish, if you're lucky. I'd rather have the flip-flop. I'd rather be in the 10% zone where 90% of the feeding fish are, right? You want to be in the smaller area where all of the fish are concentrated, not in the massive area where there might be the, some leftovers, you know, uh, uh, hoping and praying that, uh, that you're going to, you know, have one of those come, come across your boat or kayak or wading boots. So Luke, talk a little bit more about that 90-10. Obviously, we solve for that in the Insider Club. That is really our main focus every week is putting our members in that 90-10 zone. But uh, for those of you that, that aren't a member, maybe still confused, any, any tips you can share on, on how to do that? I know we talked about in a prior podcast about eliminating you know, areas just right off the bat that we know are not going to be good, uh, just to make it a little bit less intimidating. Anything else you can share there? Yeah, I mean, we know most of the fish are, are ambush predators. Uh, and so like snook, redfish, sea trout, flounder, especially, they usually hold near some sort of structure. So if there's an area that like a vast area that is just flat sand with no structure on the bottom, no bridge pilings, no dock pilings, no nothing, then you can pretty much write that off that, that that's more than likely to be a dead zone. The odds of a lot of fish congregating on just a random flat sand zone is very small. You'll probably catch some catfish there if you're lucky. 
uh, on conversely, right, you can use online maps and we have a lot of lessons on doing this. You can get free maps online, put it in the satellite imagery view, and you can actually have satellite look, you know, bird's eye view of the bottom structure. We can see under the water in many cases. You can look for seagrass patches. You can look for rocks. You can look for oysters. Obviously, dock pilings, you can, you can see uh, regardless of water clarity of whichever area you're fishing. And you can see trees. Long story short, look for structure. Look for something that these predator fish can hold next to to ambush prey. And, uh, and then when you find that structure, that's going to increase the odds of there being, being fish. Obviously, uh, fish move. So seasonally, fish move around. Even the bait moves. A lot of times, fish are, are, watch, are uh, following the bait. So it's more than just finding some structure on the map. But, but that's a big step that a lot of people don't take. Some people just go out and anchor out like in the middle of the bay and, uh, and just, just sit there and, and hope for the best. And that rarely works. In most cases, you need to actually hunt the fish down. You need to move yourself into a good zone. And we call it the 9010 zone. Move yourself into that zone. And when you do that, everything else is a lot easier. If you get into a great, a great area with a bunch of fish, you don't have to have the perfect lure. You don't have to have the perfect live bait. And you're still going to catch fish. Contrarily, if you end the if you're in the air without anything, it doesn't matter what lure you have, or you can have the most expensive bait and everything you can imagine, and you're just not going to catch fish. So yep. very, very big mistake. And, and, uh, and also to just thinking about the current flow, like how the current is hitting the structure. You want to be on an area where there's actually current flow that's coming up against the structure that's going to be bringing food to the, the spots that the predator fish are most likely going to be holding in. So the upcurrent side is, is often going to be better than some area that is like in the back of a cove that doesn't have much water flow. So just get kind of thinking about those things and just putting the odds more in your favor. Yep. And you'll know if you're in the 90, 10 zone, like you'll know quickly, you'll get strikes like with, within hopefully 10, sometimes within two minutes, but hopefully within 10 minutes where you start moving. I've seen some of those guys. I feel horrible for them. They call them the shrimp soakers and there's nothing wrong with using, using shrimp, but they'll sit there. Like you said, they'll put an anchor down and sit in a channel, whatever, We'll sit there for two hours just soaking shrimp hoping to get a, a straggler going by if you're in the 90 10 zone like we've had times luke where like when you're in the zone you can't get the shrimp down the bottom before it's getting hit hit by some even if it's getting you know taken off by a small snap or something you, you'll know when you're in the 90 10 zone i mean you're getting like ferocious strikes uh not every single cast but but you're you'll know when you're in that 90 tens and if you need help once again that's something we do in our insider club just if you do nothing else but watch luke's video on friday that's where he curates everything happening out there and does it in 10 minutes or less so basically takes 40 hours of of intel and does it in 10 minutes every single friday morning and shows you the exact types of spots based on trends based on real-time data right? Based on weather and tides and, and what other people are doing and where they're catching fish. It says, here's the exact types of spots and depth that you want to be fishing this coming weekend. We do that every single week. That's just one of the many things we do in our insider club. So if you are a current member, definitely watch those. I, I hear from members all the time saying, wow, that is like the most valuable thing. I'd pay thousands of dollars. It's like having a fishing guide in your back pocket. And if you're not a member, definitely join up today at saltstrong.com. So speaking of the shrimp soakers, number three is being held hostage to live bait. We've had a lot of pros like, you know, guys like C. Richardson and Mike Anderson, Peter Deeks, and, and each one of those guys might instantly bring up a thought of, oh, well, Peter Deeks is the live bait guy. C. Richardson's a you know, a, a hard bait or soft plastic guy, Mike Anderson kind of does both. All three of those guys on the podcast said the one thing holding back people from catching as many fish as they want is not knowing how to do both. So this is not poo-pooing a live bait, but if you can't go out there quickly, because there are days in times of year where live bait is really tough to get, if you can't get live bait quickly, or you just have an hour to fish, you are held hostage to live bait it is going to absolutely destroy your chances of consistently catching fish. We have friends that do that. They literally have never caught a fish in a lure, don't want to learn. And they're always like, man, how do you guys catch so many fish? It's like, well, we learn how to use lures. And they're like, oh man, I wish I could do that. Well, you can't, it's not that hard. Um, so Luke, talk, talk about that from your perspective, you know, cause you were a bass guy. We talked about that on a prior podcast and, and then we came into saltwater and we had read and heard that you had had live bait but that wasn't true at all. 
yeah, I basically put all my bass gear away and I, and I just brought out, like started getting cast nets and just really focused on live bait with, with saltwater fishing. And, and that's my biggest regret overall that held me back multiple years. What about the sh really growth. short hair? No, I thought that was a regret. Yeah, that's a regret too. But, uh, but you know, uh, but yeah, so the, just be because using live bait, it, first of all, it slows you down, right? You have to first go out and catch it. And many times that's going to be early in the morning especially summertime that's like the early morning twilight bite that's like the primo bite so that's usually when the, the most feeding is happening you're out there spending that time catching bait at least i was and and then when you get the bait you, you can't really move as fast so if you don't know exactly where the fish are if you don't know that 90 10 zone um you're you're less likely to find it than if you just go out with lures from the from the get-go and you can actually now start covering more water and, and you have more, my reasoning and, and my, and my regret is that I really wasn't getting better when I was using my bait because I would just go to the same kind of areas. I wasn't, I wasn't really trying a bunch of spots every trip and I didn't see many examples. And then as soon as I, I moved and I no longer had a live well where I literally could not use live bait and I bought my first little skiff, then I, I just had my trolling motor and I went back to my favorite bass lure, a little uh, bass or a little uh, jerk bait. And, uh, and now I was moving and covering water and I started actually seeing where the fish were holding and also where they weren't holding based on different conditions. And I eventually started figuring out, I was able to predict where they would be. So through lures, long story short, through lures, I was able to figure out where the 90-10 zone was quicker than I ever was when I was using my bait. So it basically just speeds up the learning process. It helps you put that puzzle together. Every day is a different puzzle. Conditions are always a little bit different. And the more times you've gone through the repetition, the, the quicker you are at putting that puzzle together. And so using lures will force you to do that. It'll enable you to do that. And, uh, and I think to me, that's the number one hindrance of the live bait focus is, is just the inability to actually cover water and to and just see more things when you're out there. Of course, you see cooler things, um, but, but just to see how where the fish are and, and to see examples of it all being put together. The word that comes to mind is freedom. The, the, when you can understand how to, how to use live bait and lures, you now have freedom. And, and what I mean by that is you're now free from not having to have a live well or a bubbler or, you know, lunking around some, you know, big heavy thing of a, a live shrimp, a bucket or whatever it might be. Uh, you now don't have to haul around a cast net and have to worry about, oh man, where we're going to find bait. Where's the bait? Uh, anyone know where the bait is or hey in the winter time when there's not much bait at all and you're sitting there like oh i'm just gonna sit in the house i guess when all my my lure guys or my buddies are just out there slaying it because winter time by the way is fantastic time to be using lures and catching a ton of fish so it just gives you more freedom and you can do it on your lunch break right i mean you could go right but you can go right before work early in the morning use some top water we have some people on our team i like jake i mean he just he doesn't even have a boat or kayak and he just loves weight fishing and catches decent, like nice fish just going out right before work and using some, some lures, some slam shady and power prawn and a, and a moonwalker uh, right there from shore and then gets back in the, in the truck and goes home. So uh, yeah. so much more freedom. Yeah. When we were in high school, we were able to afford those days where you can spend the day all on the water all day and, and eventually put the pieces together over like an eight hour span. But you know, once you get the working world, that's when it really started. That's when my fishing really struggled. And that's when, again, that's when I finally started using lures. And then I will go before work or after work just for like a two hour span. And, and then once I got better at putting that puzzle together, I was catching some really good fish in that short time with, with lures. And, and then I eventually got to the point where now it's almost, it's kind of painful for me to, to actually use live bait now when going after red snook and trout, because just knowing that the lures work, as long as you can just put it in front of a the fish's face, uh, they're going to hit it. And so uh, that was like the, again, the biggest mistake that I had, it was to focus on live bait. I was doing it exclusively and I, I remember once I throw lures, but that was just, uh, that held me back multiple years from, from getting to where I wanted to be. It's a bad habit. Speaking of bad habits, bad habit number four, this is one I think that the most people fall into, even the pros, even us, we've all done this sometimes and it's usually we'll have that bad day and we're like man we should have taken our own advice and you might be able to guess what this one is it's probably what a lot of people thought we we're gonna start talking about first it's going back to the same old spots that you caught a fish before right and we've all done it like even when we were going out sometimes like, i remember that time when i caught that big red right there and you're tempted like oh let's slow down and fish it 
Um, and in the beginning, when we first started, remember we had old Dennis and, and he showed us some of his spots and, and, and gave us freedom. Cause he, he was a great angler. He had more spots. He knew what to do with. He'd been fishing, uh, uh Charlotte, uh, Harbor and, you know, that whole area forever in Bokelia. And he gave us a handful of spots and we went back to the, we used and abused those things for the longest time. And we're so inconsistent. Some days that spot would be on fire. And then like the next three trips would be nothing like what happened? Like, Oh, I didn't realize that fish have tails and no fences. They're moving every day, moving every tide cycle. And, uh, and we didn't really get that. And so we kept going back to the same old spots over and over again. That's just a recipe for inconsistency. And, and there's something really fun. Like the, it's the adventure of going out and finding new spots, right? And all of a sudden you find something you didn't know about or never even thought about, or maybe passed by 15 times. And you're like, wow, this thing is just absolutely loaded. So uh, any, any feedback on that one, Luke, on that habit of continually going to the same spot over and over and over again? Yeah, I, I really remember how excited I was and we all were when Dennis, it was Dennis Oss, he took us to the spot and we caught our first slam. Like in one spot, we caught a redfish, a snook, or multiple fish actually, but redfish, snook, trout, we caught them all in one spot and we'd never done that before. And so we were like high five and it really wasn't that far from where we would stay when we go down there. So it was like best day ever, right? Oh my gosh, we have a slam spot. Like now our problems are over. Like now we're going to be catching slams every trip. And then then we go back there and we rarely ever caught a slam ever, ever since then. Like it was just that particular day, the conditions that were right for, and, and we had the right bait and Dennis knew it. Like Dennis knew was smart enough to know that it was really situational. That spot was really good based on the conditions and the time of the year. Whereas we were like so pumped that we went to that spot literally every single trip for the next two, three years, probably like no, no lie, like literally go back there every time. And sometimes we do. Okay. Sometimes we get totally skunked. And it was just frustrating because we didn't really know why. And it was, it was just because we weren't putting in the other factors. We would try to ma match the right tide to what it was that day or the right season or the right wind direction, but like, we'd really never like put it all together. And, uh, and, and so uh, that was, again, a big issue, putting too much faith in the spot itself. Now we're doing insider reports every week. Uh, me and other coaches go out to new areas and it's some of my best days are actually going to areas that I've never been to before. And, and you just all you can rely on are just knowing what the factors have been, knowing what the recent trends have been. Obviously, you know what the weather and the tide is going to be doing. And then just putting it together and applying what you've seen in one area, like recently or heard about recently, to foreign waters, and you can crush them. And some of my worst days are when I'm fishing waters that I've fished for, for many years. And it's like, it's just human nature to go back and okay, I've, I've caught a, my personal best redfish on this point. You go back to that point like every time, even when the conditions aren't favorable you still like have to go there. And <laughs> it's really hard to get past that mindset. And yeah. so it's, it, you really have to purposefully go against that mindset. And so we just wanted to, to make sure to highlight that because that's something that we all go through and we all will go through because that's just yeah. flat out human nature. Absolutely. And once again, if you need help finding the right spot and finding new spots, because we're going and fishing new spots every day. And, and we show them to our members just because we know that, hey, the one of the most exciting parts is sharing and helping and then finding new spots on your own. And so we do that in our Insider Club, uh, literally Monday through Friday, new new spot that we fish and we reveal everything, even some of the bad trips, because that does happen where we're like, oh man, this this actually ended up being the 90-10 zone and I didn't find it until the very end of the trip where I finally caught fish. So uh, super, super helpful to watch those. So now let's go on to number five. So I'll start it off, Luke, with a question. So my son, Jackson, is five going on six, and he's starting to get into baseball. And so the question is, if he wants to get good at baseball, which he does, and he wants to improve, and I, I want to see him become a better baseball player, I got two options. Number one, I say, Jackson, here is a baseball, here's a glove, and here's a bat. And here's a field. Go out and figure it out on your own, son. It might take you 20 years, but at some point, you'll probably figure out this game of baseball, and you might end up being decent. That's option number one. Put them out there on the field, once again, with a ball, a glove, a bat, and say, trial and error, go have fun. At some point, you might get good if you practice enough. You take them every day. Oh, yeah, take them every day. Or number two we hire a coach and get him on a baseball team where he's got other peers and he's learning from other people and he's getting to, to learn how to throw and watch other people who might be better than him saying, Oh man, I, I see how he does that. I, and they have a coach to work on the mechanics. Right. 
and and I, it's and you guys all know the answer and probably know where I'm going with this. Anything we want to get good at in life, or anything we want our kids to get good at, we we hire a coach, right? Whether it's dancing to you know to bowling to taekwondo, anything tennis, like you hire a coach, you get in a group, you be around other people, you join a team or you join a club. And yet fishing is one of the things I still don't understand why. I don't know if it's because it's predominantly men and we're all afraid to ask for help and directions, but it's like one of those only sports where people like almost have, I don't know if it's pride or just stubbornness. Like, oh yeah, I just want to figure it out on my own. I, I'd rather take 20 years and get a bunch of shortcuts. And people say that. I think like we see that on some of our, our Facebook ads and people like, oh man, those guys are cheating. They're just, they're giving away spots and showing too much and it's making it too easy. Like, what what part of that sounds bad? That sounds pretty awesome. That's what we all we all want shortcuts. I mean, you only have so much time on this earth, and as we get older and have families and jobs, our time is valuable. Why wouldn't you want to maximize it? It baffles me that some people really want to do this the hard way through trial and error versus getting help and shortcuts and having a network. Right, Luke. I'd love for you to share that story. I know some have heard it, but it's worth repeating. Cause you guys ended up beating all these full-time guides as, as dudes who had full-time jobs in this tournament series, because you formed your own little network. And that was a super small, and we now have a 30,000 person network, but tell that story real quick. Yeah. So once I, again, finally started using lures, started getting super addicted to fishing. So I was going all the time and started getting good enough to where I was like, hey, me and buddy Nick, like, hey, let's join, let's join a tournament series. And so we get in this thing at that point, we were like, this is over in the Indian river where the trout are just huge. At that point we would catch like a 25 inch trout, maybe once a quarter or so. And, uh, and that's a big trout. And, but to place in these tournaments, like a 25 probably won't do it. You need like a 27 or a bigger and so we started doing these tournaments and the very first one we got lucky we got a 28 is a really big one and uh but then over time we realized that you know we we're going up against guys they're full-time guys going to these tournaments there's a decent amount of money involved so it was some legit anglers and the guys were winning almost every time and so there was a group of us there's four different teams of two so just, literally just a network of eight people and all we did is we would just help each other out where we would talk about our pre-trip uh, fishing like where we were going uh, where we were seeing the bait, what what lures the fish were striking on, what the, depths the depth, were they yeah, holding. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and then like, uh, you know, current flow, talk about the tide and the time of day and, and how the fish were moving around. And just simply by doing that, right, went from rarely catching 25-inch trout to now catching like literally multiple 25-inch trout or bigger every trip for like for like a year. Like it was it was by far the biggest growth I'd ever had in my fishing and it was simply just having a network of like-minded anglers who enjoy fishing and, and who, who weren't hiding stuff back, like weren't holding it. Oh no, uh, where'd you catch it? Oh, I caught it in the mouth, right? Or I caught it in the water. Like, no, like, hey, I caught it at this type. You don't have to give your exact spot. Uh, we do, but, but you don't. But you can just say this type of area with this lure or this depth and, uh, and these, these conditions. And that information is invaluable. Um, another mistake I made is I used to, to log my trips. I mentioned that I was very addicted and I'm, I'm analytical. So I would, I would print out a tide chart on every trip and I would mark on that chart where I caught fish and what species they were. So I could see on the tide cycle where it was and I would sort them by month. So I had little manila folders. And then, so in, if I was going out in March, right, I would pull my March folder out and look at the past years on where I was going. And it was, it was really not that helpful. Um, it wasn't nearly as helpful as looking as just getting some real time information, like what happened the past three to seven days, or really zero to seven days. Like what happened in the last seven days is way more valuable than what happened in the past seven years. So it's all about recent information from like minded humans is is the network that we're talking about. By far the biggest growth I've ever had, and like by far my biggest regret that I didn't start doing that until probably 15 years of actually like being very addicted to fishing. Yeah. And that's why it's such an important part of the insider club. It's one that we don't talk about a lot, uh, you know, on the front end is, is we're trying to, let's just be honest, sell people to come in. And it's because I don't think a lot of people get it until they get in and they see it like, Oh, like people are really sharing and super, super helpful. 
And, and we have had countless testimonials of people saying, I just had my best day, not just because of Luke or one of our coaches, but because of someone else in the area. Now people are teaming up and fishing together, right? I mean, Joe and Brian there in Port Charlotte have been slaying it together. They're both doing good, but together, and to your point, they're now just talking and sharing, hey, I'm here in Placida, you're over here and uh, near Boquilla. Let's let's kind of meet in the middle and, and fish some of these spots and share some intel. And they've been absolutely crushing it. Yep. And I love seeing, seeing that. I, I love this whole network effect. And, uh, and, and the, the community, it's online and it's private, you know, insiders only now 30,000 members and not all 30,000 are, are in there. Of course, you're always in any type of club. You're going to have some that are super active like us. I mean, we're in there, you know, an, an hour or more every single day and some that, you know, just check in every once in a while, but, uh, but people, I mean, it's every five minutes, at least there's a new fishing report, like detailed fishing report that shows the depth in the lure or the live bait and any kind of tactics and, uh, and tips. It is incredibly helpful. And of course, some pictures and some videos sometimes and uh, and i gain from it luke gains from it our coaches gain from it i mean you you've caught some great fish because you've heard you know hey this these these fish are running right now like hey wyatt's had one hey these spanish mackerel are running in north carolina right now along this beach and then a couple of our members see that like cool i'm going out right now thank you guys so much for that tip it once again like having a fishing guide in your, your back pocket let you know what's going on and if you have a problem or a question or you're struggling you can also ask that and, and people chime in there's no negativity it's completely the opposite of, you know, Facebook where people are spamming and cursing and hating on each other. We don't allow any of that stuff. Uh, there's literally no cursing. There's no negativity, no belittling, or you're gone. We just kick you out and give your money back. And uh, the best news is it's risk-free for a whole year. And, and here's what I mean by that. We were raised by parents that, you know, taught us that we don't deserve to keep your money unless we added value to your life. And so we said, well, gosh, how would we want a company to treat us? I would love to have a one-year guarantee on everything I buy, right? How cool would that be if everything you bought had a one-year like trial, use it however the heck you want to. And if you're not 100% happy, you ask for your money back. And we do. And we've had a few people take us up on it. I mean, I'm with one person. It was like day 340 or something, almost a full year. And they asked for the money back and, and basically said, yeah, I haven't caught any more fish. And so we look, we, we have obviously, you know, a, a pretty sophisticated backend system that sees what emails you click on, sees, you know, where, if you went through the courses, sees if you're looking at any of this stuff, they hadn't looked at anything the whole time, uh, but still that was their, it was their fault. But then again, we have a money back guarantee. And so we gave them hundred percent of the money back. No questions asked. And uh, our job is we wake up every morning saying, how do we add so much value to our members that they would feel crazy to ever not want to keep renewing year after year. And we've done a really good job with that. I mean, we have many, 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 you know, people who've now been there, I think going on six years since we started, I mean, just keep renewing and keep referring people just because they absolutely love it. And it's turned into a family too. So not only do you save time by helping you get in the right spot at the right time, you also save money. We have to have with 30,000 members, some pretty sick discounts on everything you can imagine. And, uh, and then the third piece is that community, this, this network effect, uh, which is so, so powerful. And, uh, and it just ke keeps growing every day. And we're, so we pinch ourselves that we get to do this and, and hang out with awesome people, like awesome clients that we love. So if you're not one, join us today. What the heck are you waiting on? So I'm going to grab you by the hand and show you where to fish every week and put dollar bills back in your pants. Uh, that's what we're going to do. And, and I'm talking about, you know, from saving money on tackle, not anything bad. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could, I could be taken the wrong way. But, but yeah, the, the network too, I just want to emphasize the network. That was by far the biggest growth that I've had. And that's by far the biggest growth that we see now on a, on a continuous basis in the community. So that, again, that group of us four teams, just from, just from kind of ch chat with each other and, 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 and being truthful and showing and explaining where we were doing and what was working and also what wasn't working. We went from just getting crushed by the full-time guys that were in those to actually competing with them and beating them in many cases where like most of us were profitable uh, that year and really the two years that, that we did it before they stopped that whole, uh, that whole thing when, and some of us moved off. But, uh, but it, was, it was so powerful that took me from really struggling to like being decent and, and rarely ever catching like trophy fish to now placing in tournaments and going there and, and playing a, a, doing a whole tournament series and actually having the winnings more than cover the entry fee. We're literally profited. And, it, and it, we're just using artificial lures as well. Like we were going against even full-time guides using live bait. And so it, it really was my, it was mind blowing 
how much of a difference that part made. So whether you do join our club to get that, which is, I, I think, the, the best network out there for this, um, just at least find your own. They're, they're, uh, it is just incredibly valuable. So that's the one thing that kind of trumps everything else. Because once you do that, everything else comes into play where, where you talk about depth you know, with, with those people and you talk about the lures and where the fish are holding them. So as long as you do that network thing, everything else comes together. And as, as Joe mentioned, we have that community platform that's there 24 seven. And there's, there's anglers helping anglers in there all the day, every day, all day. And, and, uh, and, and we're here to help. So in case you join. Yep. Well, we call okay. it the fishing college. If you're watching, you see my shirt. It says fishing college on it. So yeah, come join us. That's it. Saltstrong.com. You current members. Thank you so much. A lot of new stuff. You've hopefully already seen the smart fishing spot system. That's this all in one app that gives you everything radar sonar satellite maps and that 3d that underwater topography view like so sick i mean I, i'm i'm loving just checking out some uh, some places that i've been interested in, in fishing it's so cool and obviously radar you can might even hear the thunder going on ahead of me uh uh get on my app and see that see how big big the storm is so uh definitely join us at saltstrong.com appreciate you guys big time look this is a good one hopefully this helped Hopefully it's helped you identify a, a habit or two or five that you might be uh, kind of in a rut and, uh, and it, man, just fix, fix one at a time. And, and, uh, and you will see your, your, your fishing game completely transformed. You'll start catching more fish and uh, you have more fun too, right? No one likes bad habits. And, uh, and yet they're all easy to fall into because uh, we've all done them. We've all been there. And, and that number four, that going back to the same spot, e even some of the best do that. Like it, it, that, that one's the toughest one I'd say. Uh, but just be conscious of it. Like Luke said, just, you got to sometimes just do the opposite and fight it and say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to go to that spot. I'm not going to go to that spot. It's a dead zone. It's a dead zone. So this was fun. Good stuff. Hope you enjoy. And any questions at all, comment section down below. We'd love to hear from you. Yep. Comment down below. See you guys in the next episode. Peace. We out. Whoop, whoop.